Okay, what's the deal with airplane mode? Because you're telling me that we put a man on the moon years ago. Well, one small step for man, but I didn't get the second phrase. But if I try and use twitter.com on my phone, somehow the plane might not be able to fly. I mean, I definitely put my phone on airplane mode because I look like this, and that means being on your best behavior when you get on a flight. But like, what happens if the person next to me has their phone off airplane mode? I just can't wrap my head around the fact that a little device like this could cause such a big problem with the plane. These are the kinds of thoughts that I have minutes before my flight takes off. And then just before I can Google it, well, the plane takes off and I have to put my phone on airplane mode. But enough is enough. I have decided to look into it. And what I found was a story that starts years before mobile phones. In this schematic transformer, the primary model, which is a part of the transformer. And off she goes from the loading ramp to the jet runway. Beautiful shoreline on full. Thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel and Clean My Mac for sponsoring a portion of this video. The story of airplane mode starts in 1958 when the Civil Aeronautics Authority started to receive word of portable electronic devices causing some sort of interference. The report was inconclusive, but now the possibility of electronic interference existed, so a notice was given out to air staff. In the same year, the brand new FAA, which is the federal FAA meaning. Which is the Federal Aviation Administration started to look into whether or not this interference was something. Apparently, these claims started to be made after some mid-sized plane crashes, including a famous one in 1956 with the Grand Canyon. So they did some research and found that some FM radios would cause interference with navigational systems. Now, none of this was ever cataclysmic. Some reports show that the system would basically put up a red flag saying that the navigational system might be inaccurate, which isn't really dangerous, but is never a good idea when relying on safety mechanisms. So in 1951, the FAA decided to ban FM radios. Now, it wasn't all FM radios that were causing the problem, but you couldn't really rely on everyone involved to know which ones were which, so a blanket ban was suitable here. A few years later, they would make this ban permanent alongside a list of approved electronic devices. These electronics were medical devices like pacemakers and hearing aids, alongside other things that were proven not to have interference, like tape recorders. They also started to test other types of transmitters and receivers, like portable TVs, transistor television that plays anywhere without plugging in, other types of communication devices, and other forms of radio. It's practical too. As early as 1964, there seems like a general consensus is being formed. Things that transmit or receive electromagnetic signals are more likely to cause interference than other types of technology. By the way, all types of electronics do emit some level of electromagnetic radiation. It's just that if they aren't deliberately emitting electromagnetic radiation, then it's usually pretty negligible. Hence why pacemakers and voice recorders are on the approved list, whereas FM radios and that type of stuff aren't. So that became the broad yardstick, things that deliberately emit electromagnetic radiation are likely to be prohibited, whereas things that just incidentally emit electromagnetic radiation are probably fine. However, after this, the FAA basically decided we're not getting paid enough to keep an up-to-date list of what's approved and what's not approved, especially as new technology comes onto the scene. So they wiped their hands of it. The FAA basically told the airlines it's up to you to determine whether or not your fleet can withstand electromagnetic interference and put in place policies according to your own tech. So there you go. If something transmits or receives a signal, then there's a small chance that there is a tiny bit of interference. But if it doesn't transmit anything, then it's probably fine. And that would have been the end of the story if technology stopped in 1966. But then we invented the extremely dangerous electronic calculator. Introducing the LC8, world's smallest electronic calculator by Sharp. Price tag to match. But before we talk about calculators, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, Clean My Mac. Clean My Mac is a product that I genuinely use. I've used it for years before they even approached us to sponsor a video. Clean My Mac is a malware-free app that's notarized by Apple. It's on the Apple App Store, so you know it's safe. That was my primary concern before using Clean My Mac, and after years of use, I can say that there is nothing fishy going on. It's been featured on the App Store and was number one product of the month on Product Hunt, so it's loved by a lot of people including myself. Clean My Mac X has a bunch of tools for helping you optimize, speed up, and protect your Mac. They've got tools to help you manage the files that you can't quite see on system preferences. Sometimes your hard drive is just full of stuff that system preferences shows as system data. In Clean My Mac, there are tools that help you clear your hard drive in a safe and secure way, 
without just leaving a bunch of quote unquote system data just lying around. I use the storage management features almost every week because with productions, I get through a lot of files in a short period of time. There are two features that I'd like to tell you about because I cannot live without them. And one is the uninstaller. Sometimes when making videos, I end up downloading weird niche apps that I use once and then forget about. And Sometimes it's quite difficult to uninstall them, especially if they don't come from the App Store. But with Clean My Mac, the uninstaller can go through and figure out which files on your computer are related to the application and make sure all of them are deleted. Which is such a lifesaver because before Clean My Mac, I used to do a factory reset every year just to clear out all of the files that I had accumulated over the year. And the second feature that is done better than I've ever seen anyone else do is Space Lens. This is their hard drive and storage visualizer. It's a really intuitive way to figure out what the big files are and where they are. The way it displays the situation on my hard drive is second to none and I would not do it any other way. After every one of these videos, I make sure I sit down with Clean My Mac and I clear out all of the stuff that's left from that production. And if you don't want that level of granularity, they have Smart Scan, a way of maintaining your Mac with the click of a button. Let Clean My Mac handle the mess and use our code ANSWER20 for 20% off. Or just try the app with a seven day free trial. But now let's talk about calculators. Introducing the answer. Power into the 80s with solar power. What's your phone number, Walter? 5550700. Uh, Master? <laughs> Why, if I'm calculating. In 1973, the FAA decided to put electronic calculators on the blanket approved list. And this makes sense given what we know about electromagnetic radiation. General bits of technology, like the calculator, don't have any possibility of causing electromagnetic interference. Right? Wrong. Two years after this thing was put on the blanket approved list, the FAA decided to examine the evidence. And this is what they found. Tests showed the effect of portable electronic calculators on navigation equipment varies with different models in different aircrafts. However, they concluded that their own examination of the evidence was inconclusive and conflicting. So what do we know about calculators on aircrafts? Very little. We know that some calculators maybe had some level of interference on some aircrafts, but the evidence was inconclusive and conflicting. But remember, the airlines can make their own rules. Some airlines did ban electronic calculators on planes and took a more conservative approach to all electronics, whereas other airlines said, this is fine. And it probably is fine. Like there's nothing, it's a calculator. But this became a growing trend of conflicting and inconsistent rules amongst different airlines. And I feel like this history explains a lot of why we're confused about how important airplane mode is today. It's part of a long history of inconsistent airline policies across different airlines. And this is why all of this has been so confusing to learn about. There is such inconsistency throughout history of what different airlines were doing. For example, because of this inconsistency, electronics manufacturers started to lobby airlines in order to make their own technology approved for use on planes. I mean, one famous example of this is the Kindle. It was a new type of device and Amazon had a vested interest in having it on planes. So so they did their own tests and promoted the fact that Kindles were safe for airplanes. But because the airlines could make their own rules, sometimes they had to be guided by public perception. For example, in 1993, there were reports that a plane started banking left after a passenger turned on a CD player. The FAA basically denies having any record of this, but it was in the popular zeitgeist. And as a result, a lot of airlines basically decided to ban electronics for a short period of time after. So in the 80s and 90s, technology begins to progress. People start using mobile phones and laptops laptops, and there's a lot of inconsistency over whether or not you can use them on planes. So where's the FAA in all of this? Well, they're still making sure that things are safe, presumably, but they have given the airlines a lot of autonomy over making their own policies. And I suspect that's because the concern that the FAA has over electromagnetic interference is quite small. While there may be some inconclusive evidence that some electromagnetic interference could cause some problems with navigational systems, it's definitely not catastrophic. The FAA's stance on this is effectively only concerned with takeoff and landing. Takeoff and landing are the most dangerous part of any flight. The FAA here has exercised a lot more caution. Under 10,000 feet, the pilots have a lot less time to react to any problems that could occur. So reducing the amount of problems that could occur is important. Here, the policy around airplane mode is a lot more strict. 
you have to have airplane mode. Electromagnetic interference isn't going to cause any cataclysmic problem with the aircraft, but if there is a problem with the aircraft, it's important to have all of the systems as accurate as possible. So given that we're on a flying tube, it makes sense to be a lot more cautious. But outside of that, as far as the FAA is concerned, it's up to the airlines to do what they want. Listen to this. The idea that devices seemingly as harmless as laptop computers and FM radios might create chaos in aircraft systems has generated extensive and sometimes unsubstantiated coverage. Lost in the uproar is the fact that more than 30 years after the issue first arose, there is still no conclusive scientific data to either establish or repudiate the notion that an aircraft filled with personal electronic devices might veer wildly off course. So even after 30 years, there wasn't enough data to conclude on whether or not electromagnetic interference is actually going to cause any problems. Anecdotal evidence suggests that the chance of an electromagnetic disruption is greater than one in a million, but reporting biases may lead pilots to erroneously attribute incidents to electromagnetic interference that might actually result from pilot error or mechanical malfunction. And this is what I found. There was a case where a phone caused a plane crash. The pilot was on his phone. It was initially attributed to the altimeter being disrupted by the electromagnetic interference, but it was later found that the altimeter was mechanical, so electromagnetic interference couldn't have been the cause, and that the pilot was likely on his phone. So can phone cause plane crashes? Yeah, but not because of electromagnetic interference. If you're literally on your phone, maybe. The paper goes on to say that in any event, it is virtually impossible to recreate the conditions that allegedly caused electromagnetic interference. But the available data indicates that the chance of electromagnetic interference during a typical flight is statistically very small, especially if passengers comply with airline policy and devices are in proper working order. All of the incidents that blame electromagnetic interference are incidental or anecdotal. Boeing has this long list of like 70 25 different incidents, and none of them have a causation between electromagnetic interference and the incident in question. It seems like the FAA's concern is completely covered by their current policy of banning technology under 10,000 feet. The airlines don't want to take a bold new stance because they don't want to be responsible if an incident was to happen. So what can I say for certain? Not very much. I can say that your phone probably, given all of the evidence I have, isn't probably gonna cause an incident on your flight. But I can't say that for certain because the data isn't there yet and no one's interested in researching it. I might be totally wrong and I'm missing some sort of source, but I really don't think so. So if the FAA policy is to do with under 10,000 feet, why is it still airline policy across all the major airlines and the law in the US and you know basically every other country I looked at? Well, it turns out that the FAA isn't the only federal organization interested in keeping the rule that way. The FCC also has an interest in airplane mode and they don't care about airplane safety at all. They're the FCC, the federal communications something or other. Well, it turns out that even if we don't need airplane mode to protect people in the plane, we might need airplane mode to protect people on the ground. When a mobile phone has no signal, it emits radiation until it reaches a cell tower. If you're really far from a cell tower, like on a plane, the phone emits increasing levels of radiation to connect to a tower. Now imagine a plane full of 600 phones searching for a signal, all emitting maximum amounts of radiation. That's a lot of radio interference in the airwaves. And like we've established before, this is likely not a problem for the aircraft's navigational systems, but cell towers can only handle a certain amount of traffic. And in populated areas like cities where bandwidth might be near capacity, having 600 extra phones connect to a tower can completely overwhelm the capacity. Basically, this would mean that a plane could accidentally become a radio jammer and cause issues for civilians on the ground. Now imagine not only one plane doing that, but all the planes in the sky. It's actually a slightly bigger issue than it seems because on the ground, a cell phone might connect to one or two towers in the local area. In the sky, a cell phone has a bigger range than it seems. And while flying, it can jam up a lot more bandwidth than it would ever on the ground. So while the jury's still out on airplane mode and airplane safety, I'm pretty confident that the reason that we still have airplane mode is that it helps protect the global cell phone network. Now there are discussions in the EU and elsewhere about trying to activate 4G and 5G on airplanes, but that's using a technology called PicoCells. And interestingly, it's something that the US are just not interested in right now. For various technical reasons that I'm not really gonna get into now, it seems like if we are gonna get 4 and 5G on airplanes, it probably won't be in the US and it'll be in the EU and 
places like the Middle East. But if we're going to all this trouble for cell service, why can we still use Wi-Fi on flights? The way Wi-Fi works is actually pretty simple. Your phone connects to a Wi-Fi router on the plane. It's the same type of router you would use in your home. That Wi-Fi connects to an antenna which is on the plane. The antenna is connecting to a cell phone tower on the ground or a satellite in the sky. Basically, airplane Wi-Fi is just a massive Wi-Fi hotspot. But the way it works is slightly different depending on if you are flying over land or sea. Over land, the plane can connect to the same cell phone network that your phone uses for 4G. However, over sea, the plane needs to connect to satellites that are sometimes less reliable. This distinction between land and sea can explain why free Wi-Fi is so prevalent in US domestic flights. It's much easier when 99% of flights are done over land. Whereas in Europe and the rest of the world, you're flying over more oceans and seas, so it's harder to provide reliable Wi-Fi. And if you're wondering why the Wi-Fi doesn't cause the same interference as your cellular network, the Wi-Fi just doesn't go that far. I'm upstairs and don't get Wi-Fi, let alone 30,000 feet. The airplane's antennas are specifically designed to connect to the network while in flight, whereas your phone is just wildly trying to emit radiation in order to connect to any cell phone network. So it causes a lot more interference than the plane's antennas would. So do we really need airplane mode? Well, we don't have a lot of evidence to say that phones were ever dangerous on a flight, but we don't have enough research to say that they are 100% harmless. And given the fact that you are flying in a metal tube during takeoff and landing, I would say yes, you need airplane mode. Even if the electromagnetic interference is negligible, if there was an incident on the flight, I would want the pilots to have the most accurate tools available to them. But if you want to rebel and turn off airplane mode in the middle of your flight, it's probably not dangerous for you. However, you may be disrupting the cell phone towers on the ground beneath you. And if enough people do that, you could be disrupting someone trying to make an emergency phone call or ordering sushi. So it could be dangerous to someone. And besides all the technological reasons you might want to turn on airplane mode, you do have to turn on airplane mode because it's the law. And breaking the law on a flight is the fastest way to get put on a watch list. Also, this is kind of a side note, but having your phone emit electromagnetic radiation to its maximum capability for the whole flight is pretty bad for your battery life. And listen, if you're brown, just turn on airplane mode and live a happy life.